St. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 5. I want to read to you from verse 17. And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, He's talking about Jesus. Jesus on a certain day. That means it happened on a particular occasion. It happened. This is not a mere story. He says on a certain day. At a certain time in history, this happened. This is not a parable. The scriptures give us here a real situation. You know, one day many years ago, I was talking about Jesus to a little class. And um, I got to a certain point and one of the guys raised his hand that he had a question. So I said, yeah. He said, you mean to tell me these things written in the Bible about Jesus really happened? I said, of course they did. And he was surprised. I said, why? He said, I thought it was just a story. I said, it's no story. It's true. And he looked into the word with me a few seconds for himself. And others were just looking on. I said, do you believe? He said, I believe. And he gave his heart to Christ. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so I know that there are people who think that this is not really so. Like some people think that the miracles we show on television are staged. They, they think it's all some kind of acting, you know. They don't think it's real. They think it's just like you have all the other shows. So this is one of the, one of the shows. Now it's more than a show. It's real. Very real. Hallelujah. So on a certain day, as we're reading here in St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, from verse 17, and it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching, as Jesus was teaching, there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. Did you notice that? The terraces of the different groups of leaders and teachers who came from all over Israel. And the Bible says, they were all gathered there when Jesus was teaching. Then, this is remarkable. After the word Jerusalem there, have you noticed where we stopped? He says, and the power of the Lord, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. He says, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Jesus was teaching. The people were listening. He says, they come from everywhere. And the power of the Lord was present while Jesus was teaching. The power was present. Where was it? Where was it present? It was present in the atmosphere over the people. That's talking about the Holy Spirit. That's talking about the, the anointing of God, the presence of God, and the power that was present was healing power. You know the different kinds of power, but this one was healing power because the Bible says the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now, just because the power was present to heal didn't mean Anybody got healed. But anyone who acted his faith got healed. Now, if you read on 
If you read on, okay, let's read on. Can I read for you? Okay. Verse 18. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. They wanted to bring this man who was sick, who was paralyzed. This man was a paralytic and they, his friends brought him. And they were looking for how to get in to bring him before Jesus. Verse 19. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. You know what they did? Now, if you study properly, you discover this house was Jesus' house. You know, some people say Jesus never had a house. This particular house was his house. You didn't know that. Okay. Well, let's go on. And that's why they didn't have to pay for what they did, for destroying the roof. <laughs> a lot of people were gathered there to the entrance that there was no space to get in. So they went up and dropped this man before Jesus. Now, verse, I want you to go to um, verse 20. I want you all to read verse 20. One, two, go. When he what? When he saw their faith, that means they did something that Jesus saw. When he saw their faith, he gave the man his attention because of his faith. Remember, Jesus was already teaching. Now, the Bible doesn't say when he heard them shouting. It doesn't say when he heard them disturbing. It says when he saw their faith. They did something. The man acted his faith. But Jesus started from somewhere, somewhere else. He didn't start by talking about the healing. He said, man, your sins are forgiven you. The man needed to act his faith to receive forgiveness for his sins. If you can receive forgiveness for your sins, you can receive healing for your body. Can you see that? Now, there are people who are unable to receive forgiveness for their sins. And because they have not received forgiveness for their sins, they are unable to receive healing. Because Satan accuses them of their wrongdoing. And they have their own conscience to remind them of their wrongdoing. And so they think they're not good enough for God's blessing or God's healing. So they need to receive forgiveness for their sins. Because many have been wicked to other people. Many have had the wrong thoughts about other people, about God. Many have spoken wrongly about other people or misjudged others. And all that is sin. All that is sin. So they need to receive forgiveness for their sins. And so Jesus said to the man, your sins are forgiven you. And of course the other people there were, they were surprised. Who is he to forgive sins? They thought, who is this Jesus to forgive sins? I mean, we know you, you're a miracle worker, um, you're a healer, but um, you're, you're a good teacher, but forgiving sins? Who are you? They didn't realize they were talking to the Son of God. But then he said something. I'll read it to you from verse 21. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? What are you thinking about? He said. Which is easier to say? Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk. He says, which one is easier? He says, verse 24. But that ye may know, 
that the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins. Let me stop there for a moment. You know, I've had some people say to me, um, you say Jesus is the Son of God, but he said he is the Son of Man. He didn't say he's the Son of He said he's the Son of God. Many scriptures abound in evidence. He said he's the Son of God. But then they say, but he said he's the Son of Man. So is he the Son of God or is he the Son of Man? Both. He's the Son of God. Remember, the Bible says he's the Word of God made flesh. And he's the Son of God. And he said he's the Son of God. Now, what does he mean when he says the Son of Man? The Son of Man because he is man's representative. He came to represent man. So to God, he was man's representative. The Son of Man, that's what he meant by that. So whatever judgment God was going to put on Jesus will be accounted to all men. So that's why he called himself the Son of Man. Did you notice he was the one who often declared he was the Son of Man? Nobody else called him the Son of Man. Always he said, I, the Son of Man. Because he knew who he was. He came to represent man. And he emphasized it. He confessed it. He declared it. Before God, angels and devils. He wanted everyone to know he was man's legal representative. Praise God. Alright, did you get that? So, that's why when he died on the cross, we died on the cross in him. When he was buried, we were buried because he was our representative. So when he suffered all those uh, punishments on the cross, we were the ones suffering. So he did that for me, for my sins, for your sins, so that we would be free. And so when God raised him up, in the mind of justice, in the mind of God, we were raised up. So when he ascended into the presence of God, we were brought into the presence of God. Where we couldn't have entered by ourselves. So he says to us, go in my name. You see that? So, he died on the cross in my name. He was buried in my name. Are you hearing this? And in your name. Because he was my representative and he was your representative. And then God raised him up from the dead in my name. And so the Bible says, if I believe that what he did was for me, then the life that he has now, the glory that he has now, the name that he has now, is for me. That's Christianity. You see it? That's why I can stand here and say these words. That's why I can stand here and dare believe God. That's why I can expect sickness to bow. Because I live now. In his name, the name of Jesus. So the Bible says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. So when we pray to the Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Wow. Wow. So if you live your life in the name of Jesus, no sickness, no disease can take a hold of your body. No demon can destroy your life. Because you live in the name of Jesus. Can you see the victory? Oh, wonderful. And then, come on here. You're still in this place? It doesn't matter what your condition is. It doesn't matter what the case is. Maybe you even came here with a child. Your son, your daughter, that's got a problem. And you're thinking, oh God. Do something for my child. Can I tell you something? He's not deaf. In other words, he heard you. God heard you. So he's not deaf. He heard you. And this meeting is organized 
It's like the, the pool of Bethesda. When the angel came and stirred up the water, that anybody could step in and get healed. Today, this is better than that pool. Amen. That pool needed to be stirred up by an angel, and only one person at a time could get healed. And it was the first person to get in that got healed. It was limited. But what Jesus came to do, can I read something to you? Galatians chapter 3. I want to read to you from verse 13 into verse 14. Okay? And I want you to follow the context very carefully. This is powerful. He says, Christ, from verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, um, us here is not referring to all of us. He's referring, if you study the context, he tries to distinguish between the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay? And how God's blessings have come. Alright? So, he explains here, Christ hath redeemed us Jews, because he was also a Jew. So Christ hath redeemed us Jews from the curse of the law, because they were under the curse of the law. Are you hearing this? If you were not under the law, you were not under the curse of the law. So the Gentiles were never under the curse of the law. But they had a problem. Their problem was, who were the Gentiles? The Gentiles were all non-Jews. If you were not a Jew, you were a Gentile. Okay? And it actually comes from the word that means heathen. Heathen. Those estranged from God. All non-Jews were called heathen. You see, that would include, include every other nation. But here's the beautiful thing here. He says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. He was made a curse for the Jew. Why? Because it's cursed is everyone that hung it on a tree. I ever tell you somebody said, cross or tree? Which one was Jesus crucified on? I said both of them. Because the cross was made from the tree. Do you get it? All right. So you have to understand symbolism. Okay. Now, let's go again from verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hung it on the tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we all of us Jews and Gentiles that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith oh God oh this is wonderful did you notice God's plan was to get the Jew off of the curse and to get the Gentile off of the condemnation so that both of them can have the blessing of Abraham come on them. Because the Jew had the blessing of Abraham but the curse would not allow them to endure it. The Gentiles couldn't have the blessing of Abraham because they were estranged from God. So God said now everybody's the same. They're condemned by their sin. So if Christ would come and pay the debt for their sins, pay the penalty for their sins, then the blessing of Abraham will come on the Gentiles and both Jews and Gentiles will be qualified to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God that brings you the presence of God. That brings you into God and brings God into you. Are you getting this? An extraordinary thing. And keeps you in the presence of God. Every day. Now, let me tell you something else. You remember the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt? You remember them? 
When they came out of Egypt, the Bible tells us, they went through the desert. Okay? Now the desert is a terrible place. The wilderness. In the night, it was extremely cold. In the day, it was extremely hot. So people couldn't live there. And now these Jewish people were going to go through this place for many years. They'll die. But God did something. The Bible says, He gave them His own atmosphere. The Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon them as a cloud in the daytime. He overshadowed them in the daytime. The Holy Spirit did. And in the night, He became a pillar of fire to give them heat. So these children of Israel traveled with their own atmosphere. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. Now in the New Testament, what God has done is to bring that power of the Spirit, that presence of the Spirit in Jesus Christ to us. So that the presence is no longer only in the tabernacle. The presence can now be in and around me. This is the blessing of Christianity. Now I can carry my own atmosphere. Now, he says, when you go through the water, it shall not overflow you. When you go through the fire, you shall not be burnt. That's why anything can happen around you. Like he says, a thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh you. Why? You got your own atmosphere. Everybody around you may have an infection, but not you. Why? You've got your own atmosphere. And it works inside and outside. Turn to St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. I want to read something to you. St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. I want you to read verse 29. I'll read it to you when you're through. Verse 29. St. Luke chapter 9, verse 29. Want to go. Oh, this is wonderful. He says, as he prayed. Who prayed? Jesus. He says, as Jesus prayed, the fashion of his countenance, in other words, the appearance of his countenance was altered. As he prayed. It means that the glory of God was revealed through him as he prayed. He was in the presence of God. This was an inner power, an inner force, an inner energy. But in Moses' day, it was outward. Turn to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. Are you there? Okay, I want to read from verse 28. Moses, is talking about Moses now. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables or tablets, the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wished not, he didn't know, that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. He says the skin of Moses' face was shining 
when God was talking with him. The Bible says Moses didn't know. And then as he stepped down, you read that further, as he stepped down the mountain and walked towards the children of Israel, Aaron and the leaders of Israel saw the face of Moses, grace joined, and they began to move backwards. They were afraid. And Moses was saying, come, listen, Moses, look at your face, your face, Moses, your face is shining. Moses didn't know. And so the Bible says Moses had to take a veil to cover his face to be able to talk with them. And then every time he went into the tabernacle to talk to God, he removed the veil and talked to God. When he came out to talk to the people, he put on the veil. Because every time he went into the presence of God, the glory came on him. Now, when you study in the Bible, when you study from Second Corinthians and, and read from the third chapter, you'd be amazed at what you find. The Bible says that that glory that was on Moses, so strong that he had to use a veil to cover his face, that that, that glory has come into us by the Holy Spirit. If you receive the Holy Spirit, that glory of God is now inside you. That's what the Bible says. So you can see it was God's plan for us to not only have the glory of God around us, like Jesus said, He is with you, but He shall be in you. Before the Holy Spirit came, he was with them because Jesus was with them. Then he said, but he will come to live inside you. You know, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says, when the disciples were gathered together in the upper room, about 120 of them, it says suddenly, this was the day the Holy Spirit came for the first time among those who believed in Jesus. And this was after the ascension of Jesus. It says there was a sound from heaven as they were sitting together in one place in one accord. It says suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And then it says, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. The presence filled the room where they were. It filled the whole house. So the presence of God can fill the house. And then it says, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The people were filled with the Holy Spirit. The house was filled with the Holy Spirit. Wonderful. So, you may be filled with the Holy Spirit, and yet the house is filled with the Holy Spirit. This presence is what the Bible talks about, where we read in St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 17, where it says, And the power of the Lord was present to heal. The power of the Lord was present to heal. The power of the Lord was present to heal. So you are in the presence of a miracle power right now. Right now, the whole room is filled with God's presence. Filled with His presence. Filled with His love. Filled with His kindness. Filled with His grace. Hey, think about this. God made us for a reason. You think God made us so He could destroy us? I mean, think about it. You think God made us so he could hate us? That just doesn't sound like God, especially when you think about what Jesus did when he came. It doesn't sound like God. And Jesus said, I and my father are one. What was Jesus like? Jesus healed people. Jesus touched even the lepers. He received them. He loved them. He cared for them. He fed the hungry. He ministered courage to the disheartened, the despondent, the fearful, 
He gave strength. And he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That means the Father is like Jesus. If that's so, it means that God always wants the best in us. God wants me to be the best of me. God wants all my potentials to come to the fore. He wants me to be the best that I could be. That's what God wants. He wants me to be healthy, strong, prosperous, vibrant, sound. That's what God wants. Hey, come on. If you make anything, you would want it to function to its best potentials. Is that right? So, why would you think less about God? So God doesn't want you sick. God doesn't want you broken and discouraged. God wants you well. And he has made it possible. Wow. He's made it possible. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anybody. Who's whosoever? Anybody. He didn't say, if you're good enough. No. He says, whosoever will may come. If you want to, you can come. If you want to, you can receive. If you can only believe, that's all he's asking for. He says, believe. What will it cost you to believe? What will it cost you to believe? How difficult is it to believe? It's not difficult. You know why? Because you don't believe with your head. You don't believe with your mind. You know, if you were to believe with your mind, you'd be reasoning. All the things you've ever heard, huh? you know, be reasoning. Believing is not with the mind. You believe with your heart. With your spirit. You can't believe something with your mind. The mind cannot believe something. The mind is the rational area of man. He doesn't believe. It's like a film. He only receives information and processes the information. He doesn't believe or not believe. You get it? So your mind just receives information and processes the information. Your computer, for example, receives information. It doesn't believe or not believe. It just works on the information. All right? So the owner of the computer, the user of the computer, decides, controls what happens with the computer. That's what your spirit is like. Your spirit controls what happens with your mind. You choose to believe. And when you choose to believe, your mind has nothing to say against it. And all you say is, I believe. The Bible says, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession, the declaration of your believing is made unto salvation. Say, I believe. I believe. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Sometimes, you know, there are Christians who've gone through problems in their lives, difficulties in their lives, challenges in their lives, and they're not sure what to do. They're not sure how to effect the changes that they require. Listen. What you need is what you already have, the Holy Spirit. If you will stir up the gift of God that is inside you, the power will be made available to effect the change that you need. That's the anointing of God. A Christian who has received the Holy Spirit is anointed. That's the anointing. You're not ordinary. If you have the Holy Spirit, you're not an ordinary person. Learn to function in that anointing. See, you go beyond this plane of life and function by the Spirit. Now this is one reason you must go to church. 
Because in church, in the local church, is where you are taught every week, every month, every year, until you are brought up in your spirituality. You are taught. The word of God is taught you. You are raised in the things of God. That's why going to church is indispensable. Because there are things I've said here now, which will come to you. And you say, wow, great information. But you see, until it is broken down in church, and you are helped to assimilate it, and day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, this thing is imparted into your spirit, and it becomes a part of you. You don't just eat a nice meal one day, and then it will make you grow. You get it? One meal, one day, will not make you grow. But if you keep eating it, if you keep feeding on it, you will grow. You will grow. But that anointing will do something for you. Now. Yes. Some of you will just notice something, a change. You know, the Bible says, as Jesus prayed, He says, the fashion of his countenance was altered. Something will be happening in your body. You may feel it. You may not feel it. Some of you will feel it. Some will not feel it. Sometimes you will feel the, the, the power of God working through you. You actually feel some sensation. But because the Bible didn't preach to us or instruct us about sensations, we don't look for them. So some people may testify and have, they'll tell us about the sensation. We don't need to seek the sensation. What we care about is what the Spirit ministers into our spirits. In my heart, I know something has happened in my life. There's a knowing inside you. You just know. You know, somebody asked me one time, how am I going to know that I'm born again? I said, you're going to know you're born again when you're born again. You'd know. That doesn't mean that Satan wouldn't try sometimes to lie to you and tell you you're not. Oh, after all, he came to Jesus. He told Jesus, you're not the son of God. If you're the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. He's trying to tell him he's not. What did Jesus do? He used the word. He used the word against the devil. He said, it is written. So, if you know what is written, you will use it and Satan will flee. So where will you learn what is written? From your Bible. And you'll know much more if you are in church.